Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, module um, on financial crisis and everyday life. This is module 12 of your course, Politics 1500. Um, and today we're working with the Matt Davies chapter to try to develop some insights into not just what happened in the financial crisis in 2008, because we, we've talked a little bit about financial crisis before in this course, um, specifically here to talk about uh, the financial crisis in relationship to um, some of the transformations in the nature of the economy that we have witnessed and seen in the last decades. Um, it's often said, to put it perhaps oversimplistically, that uh, we have shifted from a production economy sometimes people call that a Fordist economy Henry Ford of course having um, uh, developed factories uh, very much based on, on, on physical manual labor to uh, take workers and arrange them in and around an assembly line in a division of labor around an assembly line where people were doing repetitive tasks and because Ford I guess is the kind of iconic figure associated with that era even though he wasn't the only person doing uh, arranging production that way by any means um, he was the first to kind of innovate an efficient assembly line system so we had that era perhaps leading up to as late as the 60s maybe the 70s and then it is said um, that a series of financial shifts took place then uh, with the emergence of um, a different type of production system, a more uh, sort of information technology based production system, but it didn't just change the way production was happening within the factory, it changed the way value was created even outside the factory because um, it led to the emergence of a kind of an intellectual labor, it led to the emergence of a labor based on even emotions and what sometimes theorists call affect, A-F-F-E-C-T, affect, which is how you're feeling and how everyone is feeling as a group, you know. Um, so if I tell you a joke and you all laugh, that's a that's an indication of, of a shared affect uh, being felt across the group completely. So um, uh, we have then an economy emerging in the 1970s beginning to be based on immaterial products, right? Financial products, uh, products that give you a certain feeling, products based on a certain image. Um, I, for one, am interested in the show Mad Men, as I've mentioned to you before, where you see some of the early innovations in producing immaterial affects um, in, in the way advertising was carried out, for example, and I think that sort of reached a critical mass by the 60s, 70s, um, and then combined with the kind of shift towards financial products and the emergence of Wall Street as a very significant player in the relation to the scale of the US economy. Um, uh, with the uh, emergence of what sometimes people call neoliberalism in the 1970s, the end of the Bretton Woods system that we've talked about before, um, all these things sort of combine to create a new type of economy. So here, jokingly in the slide, we have a great bull. Of course, the bull is the key image um, of the financial crisis. It's also the image of Wall Street. And here is this bull uh, doing something rather lewd, um, but um, you know, being a very destructive figure at the same time. Um, and I kind of like this image because I think it speaks to um, you know the sort of um, ways in which uh, the bull image is typically deployed. Uh, this is this is not you know the bull as, as we'll see. I've got other bull images coming for you down the. A lecture here, but uh, the bull image is typically deployed as a figure of strength, as a giant bull statue on Wall Street, and when we have a good market, we call it a bull market. Um, uh, the opposite of that is a bear market, which is a, a downwards uh, trend. Um, so uh, here is a bull that's not behaving as it's supposed to relative to the types of images that we typically invoke and think about and expect in relation to prosperity and the financial system. So um, we've discussed a little bit before then about uh, Bretton Woods system. We've discussed a little bit before about neoliberalism, um, its impact as an ideology. We discussed in the last module about flexibilization and how uh, free market uh, uh, theory 
has become much more prevalent since the 1970s. We've discussed how that has led to the promotion of short-term contracts, flexibilization of labor, um, and um, the point is, of course, that this flexibility in a post-Fordist era is not just required of us in relation to what we do at work. And neoliberalism is an all-encompassing um, lifestyle, if you will. It's not just about the way we work, it's about the way we live. And my goal today is to try to explain that to you, why neoliberalism matters for the way we live, how it makes us um, uh, calculative in our daily lives, how it makes us um, flexible in our daily lives, how it, how it forces us, rather, to become flexible in our daily lives. Um, um, and uh, you can see this in all um, all manner and all my very even the, the sort of minor facets of things we do in our lives, such as the way we interact online, for example. Um, are we uh, uh, we're, we're we're living very public lives? We have to be careful how we represent ourselves. We have to be cautious. You know, so this sort of very sort of um, strong sense that comes from. I guess this is the point I'm trying to make. That there's a strong sense that comes from um, when we think about neoliberal life. Um, it's not just an economic type of life, it's an economization of our life because when we're in the market, we're very calculative, right? We want to get a good bargain, we want to get a good deal, we don't want to get screwed. But think about it has, uh, in terms of how this affects our daily life as well. Um, I'm careful about what I fo post on Facebook or on Twitter I'm uh, because everyone can see it. And I'm kind of expected to be on there. My life is on public display. That's new, right? And And that caution that comes from that because not that we're worried about what people might think per se, but we're worried about how it might affect us, right? You know, like I might not actually really care if people see nude photographs of me online or something, right? But I care that the market cares. I care that um, that it might prevent me getting a job or it might affect me in terms of the relationship I have to my employer down the road. And you are being told that increasingly today as you get ready for entering the employment market yourself once you have your degree, constantly the university is reminding us um, to be careful about how we represent ourselves in our online persona and if you think about it, that's all very new that's only in the last 10 15 years that really that's become an issue for us and we still don't quite get it we are culturally we haven't caught up for that yet so anyway that's a digression to a certain extent but yes fordism um what what matt davies i think is talking about in the chapter is is a, is a financial crisis that's particular to this era that we call post fordism that is, it's a crisis of a system um, that is not just sort of located in something called the economy, but it's a crisis of a system where the economy has subsumed and encompassed every form, every aspect of our life, and we are economically uh, thinking now. We are economized. We have become economic creatures, or what the what what um, the economists might call Homo economicus. And um, so, what does it mean now that we are no longer really human? but we are economic creatures? I think that's a really good question and it's a question that we should keep in mind as we think about what it is today that is in crisis as we think about the financial crisis. And this might seem like a very philosophical question, but um, it's not really um, because it's, it's it, well, it, it is, but it's a helpful philosophical question, I suppose. And, and when you think about it, it, it can be thought of quite simply because it's simply about this question about, you know, if we think about it, we're working all the time today. We're working all the time for ourselves. We're working to represent the interest of our own, if you will, human capital, right? I might not be rich, but I have potential within me, which has value within the marketplace. And I'm caring for that. I'm cultivating that. That's why I'm in school. So, you know, when I'm at home and I'm taking the shower, normally that in human terms, cleaning yourself is is not considered economic activity, right? Or um, chatting with your parents or whatever, you know, at dinner table. More and more, those parts of our lives are becoming opportunities to think about our own capital, to, to work to better ourselves. And so if, if the financial crisis isn't just a crisis of Wall Street, this is, I guess, the question, right? If we expand the stakes, if we think about the financial crisis as something that's actually taking place in a post-Fordist context, it's really a crisis of the valorization of our everyday lives, right? It's it's a crisis of the involvement of people in this collective phenomena that we have now, where in every single facet of our life we're making value. Um, and, and if that sounds nuts and insane, 
Um, let me talk you through it in the next few slides and we'll see where we stand um, in a few slides from now, okay? So the outline today, um, the outline, it, basically we're going to follow the chapter. I'll add in some of my own things as we go, uh, but we'll be talking about politics and everyday life, finance and the financial crisis uh, as our example of, of how everyday life and the economy and politics are now all wrapped up together in ways they weren't really before. And they've always been to a certain extent, but today we've intensified that, I think is the point. Uh, we're gonna have some responses to that about you know how we might try to, to think our way out of this and then um, talk about things like the Occupy movement and things like that that have tried to really put a, a whole new spin on, on, on how we relate to the economy. So again, we are talking about um, what it is in, in some ways to think about the financial crisis. You know, what is it that is in crisis? It's a new type of financial crisis. Um, in the last lecture, we've discussed the origins of neoliberalism and the end of the Bretton Woods mechanism. We discussed the, the, the Nixon shock, the Kissinger shock, excuse me. <laughs> and um, we discussed that the United States could no longer afford to be what we call the numeraire, the spender of last resort, or in other words, the hegemon that kept the whole global financial architecture moving along according to the, in, in relationship to the what was called the gold standard. And so back then, of course, we had a crisis um, of a system um, that could no longer make enough value to afford the country and the people to do what they wanted to do. It was a system, a system that was going broke from its own internal contradictions. It was, it was paying a lot of money, printing a lot of money to to uh, pay for the Vietnam War and for social services. It was trying to have its cake and eat it too. Um, but of course, if the United States had committed to the gold standard and it was trying to do all these other things as well. It just, you know, obviously reality intervenes and you can't print money and at the same time guarantee the world that your currency is back to gold. Um, so what happened um, there then was that costs had to be cut and uh, we had to figure out a way to pay people less money in order to um, reinforce, uh, to, 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 to re-support, um, if you will, or reinvigorate uh, the financial system to reinvigorate effectively th this wonderful word profit right because if corporations are not making profit then capitalism is not working so so in order to do that in the 1970s effectively what had to happen was an inflationary attack this is sometimes known as I'm, I'm kind of getting deep into the bush here with this so forgive me uh, none of this would be on an exam but um, what what effectively is is being pursued as a kind of an inflationary strategy. Paul Volcker and others were involved in this in the 1970s um, to, to, to try to basically get wages down and um, the paradox and we'll cover this in more detail later when we talk about the David Harvey lecture uh, that, that we saw the little cartoon video of that I posted that link separately to this video in the syllabus that you can watch but um, but the question is that, that Harvey's asking and we'll come back to this in more detail later in the lecture but what happens if you start to pay people less what happens if you start to pay a whole country less right if the whole population is earning less money all of a sudden then of course there's a there's a hit right uh, collectively people are consuming less supermarkets are selling less so so you're going to need to figure out a way to to get people um, to to work more, you're going to get find to need to find a way to get people to 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 buy more, um, even though perhaps they're not earning enough money. Um, so uh, this is probably the, the the sort of the clincher for um, thinking about post Fordism, the way in which we work now, even in our leisure time, the way in which. You know, we take work home, we're working off the job, we do intellectual types of labor now, we can make value for our company off the job, we can be thinking about ideas um, off the job, we can be um, rehearsing off the job, you know. So we, uh, for example, do a lot of call center work today, you know, if your computer breaks down, who do you call? You call the call center and there's someone there on the other end of the line trying to figure out how to help us. That person has had to study at home. Um, had to practice how to express their voice, how to be a nice person, right? So they're bringing in skills and capacities from other parts of their lives. Henry Ford's worker was just putting rivets on a car. Today we are making value through building relationships with um, with all kinds of people um, through these encounters in virtual spaces like being on the phone. And so um, 
so so this is a this if, if in that sense then we have a financial crisis today it's a crisis that emerges out of a crisis of profitability in the 1970s because of the debt incurred from the Vietnam War and other things like this where where effectively profit had to be restored and in order to do that um, people had to be put to work to make value in all kinds of ways outside of the traditional sphere of what we call labor which was putting rivets on the car on the factory assembly line today um, if I'm an architect when I'm taking my shower I'm thinking even though I'm not at work I'm on the clock in some ways because I'm at home and I have to be thinking about how to make value okay um, um, if I'm a phone worker on a on a a, 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 a help desk or a call center help desk I'm um, in using skills from other parts of my life that I'm building in other parts of my life um, my energy my emotional energy that I'm creating in other parts of my life which is normally for my leisure in other parts and other times and places in human society all of a sudden it's becoming a fuel or a reserve of energy emotional energy that I can use when I'm um, at work um, on the phone representing Dell or Apple or some other computer company telling people how to fix their computer um, maintaining that smile in my voice as I'm um, working with them so so um, all that to say value has a new center of production today um, so hold that in mind if you can as we go through the lecture okay because we're about to talk about the politics and economics of everyday life so, um, as Matt Davies develops, Henry Lefebvre was a scholar of ordinary life. In order to allow us to do important things, um, he argued, um, and of course I think there's other philosophers that are, uh, you know, uh, important in the history of telling this story as well, people like Rousseau. Um, there's a difference between, um, and J.S. Mill as well, there's a difference between the, the higher life and the everyday life, you know, the the life of those moments in in your in your existence where where things feel like um, you're doing something important versus the less important things that your brain is kind of switched off on like putting on your shoes eating your dinner that kind of thing so we we go on autopilot for the less important parts of our lives we have mental habits there that are built into our brains to allow us to do things uh, kind of like in a shortcut fashion um, so we don't think about these things like we don't think about how we're driving our car when we're driving our car we're doing it on autopilot and ideally these shortcuts these mental shortcuts help us get through the day-to-day -day aspects of our lives they help us to stay fit properly nourished safe um, and so they get us through our adult lives right they help us even do things like raise family these mental habits right these compart compartmentalized parts of our lives that we can do on autopilot um, so the nice thing about it in some ways is that we don't have to think about these things when I'm driving my car I can be thinking about well important things right um, I can be thinking uh, while, while one part of my brain is busy driving the car the other part of my brain is thinking about what am I going to lecture about today right so one uh, w one virtue of that is it, it buys me time to be extraordinary, right? To be an extraordinary person, and and we all do that in our own various ways, right? Um, um, now, now, one disadvantage of 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 thinking this way and living this way is that we we lose track of the rather extraordinary nature of those mundane parts of our lives, and um, we lose track of how our ordinary lives might be um, uh, you know involved in uh, unnecessary right the importance of them um, so so there are times in society when things happen when those everyday parts of our lives suddenly become um, back suddenly get back on the table again suddenly gain our attention again and usually it's when we're sick or if there's some kind of social crisis like a financial crisis right because when our ability to do those things like be nourished drive the car you know because you know take that shower be clean whatever have you when when those things get disrupted it can honestly it can be genuinely like the rug got pulled out from underneath you because you can't do the higher order things anymore um in fact if in fact um oddly and this is is a point that matt davies makes you know you you actually can't even really be political right because you're 
you're basically compromised. You know, you're you're not able to do the higher things anymore. Like politics is a a higher form of mental activity, isn't it? Right. You have to reflect and think and be proactive and to anticipate. Um, w when you're too busy wondering where the next paycheck's coming from, and the everyday part of your life is sort of unraveling, um, you can't really be political in that sense. So, so the paradox then here is that actually these ordinary parts of our lives are are very political because politics in the higher sense depends on these lower things being in place. It's a precondition. Um, so in this sense then our ordinary lives, while we think they're banal, while we think they're quotidian, while we think that they're everyday, they're not at all. They're actually much more important than that. Um, so this is the famous bull on Wall Street and, and you may not know it. Um, but he's an important figure. Uh, and, and when the market is doing really well, as I said earlier on, we call it a bull market. Uh, this famous bull on Wall Street um, is a symbol of, of the prosperity and good times that sometimes happen on Wall Street, right? The opposite of this is a bear market, but to my knowledge, there's no bear um, um, a statue on Wall Street. Now, years ago, nobody really paid much attention to Wall Street. Today, however, it's everywhere. Every time we turn on the TV news, the stock market ticker tape is running along the, the bottom of the screen. It's telling people how uh, the markets are doing. It's telling people how Wall Street is doing. And, and to an extent, we need finance in our lives. We, 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 we pay attention to these things because it's important. We want to know how Wall Street's doing. And, and, and finance has an important role to play anyway right in our lives i mean it's 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 how we connect to people it's it's how we it's how we connect to people when we need money for things right and and that's a very human thing in a free market society right we want to have that system so um so money is a resource that we can obtain through the realm of finance we call it credit if you are a successful person with a good reputation, by the way, you can borrow lots of money. You can borrow a lot. You can you have good credit, right? And and credit is useful. With with credit, you can you can start a business. You can expand your existing business, and you can make money uh, in order to pay back the money you owe, but also to keep a part of it, reinvest it, or enjoy it as as profit in some way, shape, or form. Um, but obviously. Uh, in in the present context, it's it's very clear to see that some people don't have a good time getting credit. Right, they have a hard time getting credit. They're they're more likely to be a risk in terms of their economic profile. Right, they're, the banks see that their ability to pay back the borrowed money is not as strong as others. So so the, we say these people have poor credit. That they're risky. They're a risky prospect. Um, now some lenders want to deal with those people. Um, they're willing to lend the money, but at a higher price uh, when it comes time to pay it back. We can say it has a higher interest rate. So, so we see here different functions of finance. First is the 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 function of credit, which we've just discussed about. Second is the quality of distribution of risk, and um, and so finance, because it has the ability in, in the market, the finance market has the ability to see who who deserves. To be taken sort of with with trust, and who deserves maybe to be distrusted a little better? Who who's the more risky person? Who should we lend money to with a higher interest rate? Um, that's a that's a, an important function of the financial market. There's a third function then of finance, which we can discuss in relation to these other two: credit and the distribution of risk, um, and that is the importance of finance as a commodity. Right? That that if we just look at, at, at finance as a circulation of credit, we forget an important part of the story that that some people are in this, well, everyone who's lending money is in the business of making money as well, right? So they don't just loan it for a laugh or to be kind. They loan it in the expectation that it is an investment and that it is sort of something that they want to see again. Uh, they want to see their money back and they want to see it with interest. Now we have to talk about financialization. Um, having talked about the utility of finance, which factually is, you know, of course, very useful, right? Um, 
clearly we live in a time where that third function of finance, um, the way that, it, that, it's a, that it's a commodity and it can be used to make money, has started to play a much greater role in the way we organize our economy. And, and so financialization then for, for Davies is what he calls the progressive insertion of the logic of finance, which we've just been talking about, extending credit, distributing risk, and making money from money into more and more areas of social life. If you take the brakes off the financial world, if you deregulate it, as we discussed in the last module, um, it will start to encompass more and more of our lives, right? So you remember our story last module is about the difference between the era of Bretton Woods, which was so influenced by people like John Maynard Keynes, who we discussed, and then the era of neoliberalism, which was born in the 1970s, um, and which we still live in today. Well, what, what we didn't discuss so much in that module was that in the post-World War II era, people weren't just paid better, they were also working more, right? Their productivity was going up because we had more machines and we were more skilled as labor, we were more intellectual as labor, and we could work those machines really well. So, so it was not so much about people um, having more money because they were working more or they were working harder. They were working better, right? Um, and that's the key thing about productivity, right? So, so if productivity is going up, that means more value is being made per hour that we work for our employer, right? And their profits are going to go up. Now, in a fair system, if your productivity per hour is going up, you should be paid more, right? Um, your share of the cake should increase because the cake is is growing and it's all to do with every with, with what you've been doing for your employer right so you know he's sort of sitting back here a little bit so so the productivity is soaring um up to the 1960s we had salary increases that were commensurate with those productivity gains what is interesting about the world after 1975 is that though productivity has to con has continued to, to go up. You know, the, the gains per hour of our labor in terms of productivity have continued to go up. Wages have not gone up in keeping with that productivity gain, right? Our, in fact, relatively speaking, they've declined. Um, so the major implication of this has been that US middle class is working better, right? It's being more productive. Um, but in order to maintain its lifestyle, ironically, it's having to go more and more into debt because, as we know, wages started to slough off because of policies, monetary policies that were introduced in the 1970s and in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan and perhaps even arguably up into Clinton and since, right? But but to, to cover our costs, we've turned to credit, we've turned to borrowing, we've turned to credit cards, mortgages, car loans, school loans, and we even borrow sometimes to pay off our medical expenses. That's new in America. That wasn't always the way things were. Um, uh, certainly, the, the ginormous school loans, people graduating now with upwards of over $20,000 on average of school loan debt, um, that never happened before. Um, when people graduated from college before, they would maybe have a little bit of debt, but they, there were jobs promised for them. Today, we have uh, loans uh, that we borrow for school and um, and, and quite often the jobs aren't there, especially in this context of a financial crisis. So, so it is a risky time. And again, when people have debt, it means they're being very careful. It means they're being very calculative. Um, and one of the things we're doing today, what because daily life, things like education, healthcare, cost us in terms of debt, we've become very economical with our lives. Again, we've become culturally homo economicus. We are conditioned, if you will, to be more economic in parts of our lives where we never really were economic thinkers before, right? And so that's the key difference in the generations, right? The previous generations didn't have to deal with that. Um, we do. So in this slide, we have um, a superhero. We're, we have a superhero on the slide here. Um, uh, he is uh, the unemployed superhero. Uh, he is, he says, the master of degrees, but shackled by debt. And you can see here the point that he's trying to make. Uh, it really sort of animates this argument that we were just making in the previous slide. Um, he's shackled by student loans. Um, this guy, probably an average student in some ways, you know, but, but, you know, our average students are really damn smart people when you think about it, right? They do a lot. They transform themselves 
over the course of four years or five years, um, maybe sometimes if you take in the slow boat, um, from being a high school student uh, for the greater part to being someone who's ready for employment and ready for the big world, who has all kinds of valuable skills and capacities to offer in this market and economy of immaterial labor. Um, but this guy, um, having uh, you know spent twenty plus thousand dollars on average to go through higher education, finds on the other side that he has student loans and finds that there's no job in the context of the financial crisis waiting for him. And that's a very depressing thought. So, so he's uh, engaging in a kind of ironic protest here. Um, this is, I think, for some people, um, a, 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 an indication of the financialization of our daily lives. Um, it indicates how, again, in the context of the society that we live in today, so much of our life is subject to the edicts and, and, and requirements of being a responsible financial citizen. And people in previous generations just did not, ha did not have to worry about their lives, their everyday lives in this way. Um, when they went to work, they went to work, and when they left work, they left work, right? Today, we're being calculative and careful in, in every sense of the term, or in every part of our lives. Um, now, um, people. It, it's it's interesting that we that we make that observation because to think about it, a lot of people today complain about young people. They complain that young people are are kind of lazy, um, that they're not motivated to to get jobs. Um, the so-called millennial generation or Generation Y is one uh, that is seen as politically passive. What is Generation Y? Well, it, often it depends on the definition, but if you were born between the early 1980s and the early 2000s, you're typically Generation Y. Um, and, and when people talk about this generation, they often talk about it as politically unaware, they don't read newspapers, perhaps even they've sold out. And, and we have to think about that in relation to our story of everyday life and politicization of everyday life, because the question is, in the context of what we've been talking about, wouldn't you sell out too? right and 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 so we ask the question should we really be complaining about this generation why should we be complaining about young people today not being as politically active as young people of previous generations let's remember older folks came of age in a very different world the, the lines of opposition politically speaking were much easier to see in the 1970s Daily life was a lot less packed with advertising. Today, Generation Y is absolutely surrounded by advertising. Today, everything has advertise advertisements on it. Um, stadiums, libraries, uh, universities, museums, they're all, they all seem to be corporate sponsored in some way, shape or form. They all have logos on them. Um, they're all built in these public-private partnerships. And so uh, we call our stadia, you know, after a company instead of its actual name, right? So w even when we spend time online, um, on Facebook or whatnot, we're being tracked. Uh, large companies like Google, Facebook are tracking our activities. Um, they're making sure that the adverts that we see suit our tastes. So we're being, our lives are kind of being commodified in a certain way. And, and our act action, our clicks are driving profits and revenues for a lot of companies, you know, because Google is going to make money from every time an advert for a certain company is clicked on and if Google can really promise that it's delivering adverts to the right people, you and I, for certain types of things, I like a certain type of shoe, if that shoe is appearing on my website uh, as, I'm, as I'm going about my business searching on Google, um, then uh, Google's going to make money from those advertisements as I click on them and, and go to buy those shoes. So, so these advertisements are clearly a big part of our life. Now the question is, how do those advertisements, which are part of our everyday life, how do they affect us politically? Um, arguably they do affect us politically in some ways, because if you think about it, they tap into our desires for a certain type of lifestyle, um, for a certain type of status even. Um, we want those shoes because they are symbols of a kind of way that we want to represent ourselves to the wider world as living. Um, and so there's there's a way in which advertising matters. But actually even apart from advertising, there's another factor at work here that 
really does speak to this way in which everyday life has been financialized and that it affects us politically. And if that's true, maybe we shouldn't be so critical of um, the, this, this generation Y. So think about it this way. In, in our parents' generation, education was very, very cheap. And since 1980, the average price of a four-year college degree has, has gone up dramatically from just under $9,000 to about almost $22,000 at this stage. And a lot of people can't afford that. They have to borrow money to pay for it. So in 2013, the average student was almost $30,000 in the hole after graduation by the time all was said and done. Um, total student debt then, so you have $30,000 average student debt in 2013. Total student debt actually is four times greater in the last decade alone. Um, uh, it's, it's gone up four times, right? It, it's it recently surpassed $1 trillion nationally. And most of this is held by poorer income families. So as, as the Astrid Taylor, who's a commentator on this, says, over the course of a single generation, education has been transformed from a relatively affordable public good into a social necessity priced as though it were a luxury item. We live in a post forda society where you really can't get a job unless you have intellectual skills of labor, right? I mean, sure, the sale of some of those traditional jobs left, but even those are, are, are rely on and use information technology to actually um, to actually function, right? So, so we live in a dot com era, and and dot com inflects even the most traditional manual physical jobs um, now, uh, whereas it used not to uh, at all, right? I mean, a, even carpenters today need to know about online stuff, how to work the internet, how to how to work a computer, um, not just to do what they do, but to to run and manage their business and to the run and manage their financial affairs. Um, so this this quadrupling of educational debt really speaks this idea that people recognize, and poor income families especially recognize that to to be successful in this age, they need that education. But in the meantime, our education is becoming more and more expensive. And and so why is that happening? By the way, I I, I it's a digression. It's not really part of this lecture. But if you're interested, um, one of the reasons many commentators offer for why education is becoming so expensive today is because our universities are being run in more like businesses. Our universities have to run more like, more like businesses, even the public ones, because the state subsidy uh, has been cut, the federal subsidy has been cut. So students are having to borrow more to go to more expensive schools who have to run themselves more like businesses and hire people to run them with CEO level type experience, business world CEO type level experience in order to manage this business, right? So where uh, most of the money that colleges used to spend was on faculty salaries, faculty salaries today take up um, quite a small part in the greater scheme of things. It's the new administrators that have been brought in in the last 20 years or so who are accounting for the greatest share of the growth of the cost of your education. So now com combine the debt, the student debt, with the poor economy, the few jobs, the flat wages, you have a bad situation there. And and it means our students are graduating in trouble, right? And, and they're in trouble especially because unlike other areas of your life where you can go into debt, um, you can't claim bankruptcy when you're a student in the United States of America, right? Your student debt is, um, is, is with you um, for a long time, and it's with you in a very real way. Um, you, you you can never get rid of it. It's there for the rest of your life. And so, because of this, um, young people today are very much forced to live in a rigorous, calculative way where they're applying a cost-benefit analysis, weighing the pros and cons of their decisions um, in the education market constantly. And the question is, right, um, you might be wondering, well, is that such a bad thing? Well, it is a bad thing if you think about it in terms of how likely you are to pursue your dreams in that reality, right? If, if, if everyday life has become expensive and has required calculative cost-benefit analyses, 
how likely is it that you're going to take the risk to become a student of philosophy or a student of journalism or some other career of your dreams living with debt means that those dreams and possibilities are being foreclosed and it's a sad thought but it's a reality that many people are living with today so on top of this then um, to think that the people probably who who should be helping us the most the university faculty um, you know to help us understand and develop critical learning skills to help manage in this uh, difficult time um, you know they are uh, not really accessible to us because of the high cost of education. We won't be going to the classes um, that offer the most esoteric, the more esoteric type subjects because of the expense of what we're trying to accomplish here. Right. So, so why does all this matter? Right. Um, why are we talking about um, everyday life in this way? I think you know if if in if in this slide we have the the student who who cannot. Um, you know, uh, step outside of the parameters of a risk society, a risk sensitive or a hyper aware of risk society, um, then y y what we have to do is is think about the politics of this, right? You know, wh what does it do to us politically? Um, and we see here again the bull image, this time with a ballerina on top of it, which is not what you typically expect or think to see. Um, we also see um, in the in the background shapes of students maybe who might be protesting um, or perhaps the hint or suggestion of tear gas floating around the bull. So so there's a suggestion here that the the idealization of the bull um, is a problem uh, that is being contested, that's being protested, that there's a conflict, there's a political conflict in and around uh, the the bull, right? So so going back to Davies now, you know he's clearly talking about exactly the transformation that we're discussing here uh, this transformation that is happening to us under financial life we all know that in 2008 there was this terrible financial crisis that is put government under tremendous strain to hold the banking system together um, you know it had to borrow a lot of money already for for the wars that we had been fighting in 2003 in Afghanistan and Iraq um, that combined with the, the debt that it was now going to owe uh, for bailing out the banks that took these risks, well, naturally it's going to leave very little money for things like education. It also, the financial crisis hurt a huge number of people who were left unemployed or foreclosed out of their homes. Um, it cut the salaries of these people, made them unemployed, reducing the tax take that the states and the federal government could take from the people, thereby further constraining the amount of money available to to uh, engage in programs of government assistance, that kind of thing. So, so the financial crisis then, in a way, points to the stakes of the financial system for everyday life. Right? It shows how fragile the current financial system is when things start to go wrong, and how finance really does affect people's lives in this highly complex way with all these interdependencies attached to it. Um, yet we don't really see the everyday aspect. Again, this is, as Matt Davies is arguing, the realm of the ordinary, right? And, and we're trying to argue that it's not ordinary at all, but it is the realm of the ordinary. We think it was a crisis caused by some bankers in banks like Goldman Sachs who miscalculated, right? There's a there's an interpretation of the crisis, we'll call it version A, which is a technical crisis, right? It was a, a crisis of miscalculation, it was a crisis of credit, it was a crisis of circulation um, of goods and services in this space called the market. Um, and in this sense, we, we think the crisis took place on Wall Street. Um, so in fairness, the crisis seems to have, you know, conform to that stereotype a certain way, uh, there's a truth to it, right? The crisis did involve banks. It put a lot of financial institutions in the at the brink of collapse, but it, it goes further. It, it, it has a what we might also call, as Matt Davis puts it, and I think it's a useful term, it has a political excess, right? That the our understanding of the crisis as we sort of typically tend to think about it um, is is politically 
stretched beyond that definition, right? The, the, the definition that we use doesn't fully encompass the breadth of the politics involved. So that to, to, to say that the crisis has a political excess means that there's a political aspect to it that, that cannot be fully described or captured in language that we're using if we're only describing it as a technical crisis, right? So we know that's true because of all the people who protested it, of all the Occupy movements that took place um, f from people who felt that their everyday lives were hit by the crisis. So the 2011 Occupy Wall Street movement then was this effort to demonstrate or speak to this political excess, to make the financialization of our lives, which normally goes unseen because we think of finance as a separate realm of, to our lives. We think of the economy as a separate realm to our lives. Um, even though our lives are increasingly economic, right? And, and so, to be concrete then, the demand of Occupy Wall Street was, if nothing else, a demand to renegotiate this system so that if our lives are going to be financialized in this way, that we should demand a quid pro quo. We need some kind of compromise deal while you're going to go and bail out these banks and take care of the rich guys and give them all the favors and handouts that they need, right? you're telling us in the same breath that we no longer have space for art, for philosophy, for life outside of the financial system. And and the, the ballerina on top of the bull really is a kind of an aesthetic um, um, argument um, that we need to start thinking about, again, how to get back to a life unhindered by debt, a life that does not have to be so calculative, where there is time and space for art alongside the power of this raging bull here. Now, um, let's talk about this guy. This is Jacques Rancière, and um, uh, this sort of concludes this section of the lecture. Um, I'll be back in a moment for part two, and you'll have a link to that separately to the link to this video here. But the Rancière, Jacques Rancière, pictured here, um, is a philosopher who is sort of known for looking for politics in these unusual places, like everyday life. For him, the things that we tend to think of as normal, as normal politics, which this was typically government, right, you know, paying your taxes, getting your driver's license, um, uh, you know, various things like this. Um, for him, those are activities that are much better thought of as police activity. And not police in the sense of the way we use the word today, as in law enforcement, but police in the more 19th century version of the word, um, as used in France, which is much more to do with the execution of policy, right? i.e. it is the art and science of government, as Matt Davies puts it. And so what that really means or speaks to is the idea that government has a technical side to it, a bureaucratic side to it, and, and it's where the population interacts with government. and and how government introduces various policies is going to shape and mold that technical interaction with the population. And, and that's everyday, ordinary, banal, quotidian politics then for you and I. But politics is so much more, right? Politics is an imagination. Politics is a vision of how the world can be. So for Rancière then, this, this 18th century, 19th century version of the word police is interesting because it describes the point where we encounter government and I suppose in our imaginations that's what we think of as government but it's not politics, right? Politics is is found everywhere for Rancière, right? It's, it's about the habits and the way we organize our everyday lives. It's about what we imagine we can talk about politically, right? Um, and in a financial crisis, that imagination is constrained, and that's the problem. In a real democracy for Rancière, people are enter able to enter into the realm of public debate as equals and express views which make other people sensitive to, to their needs, to their passions, to their desires. Um, in this financial crisis, much of that has been foreclosed um, because of the logic of the economy and this idea that we must save the economy at all costs. That all these cutbacks and the cutting away and the eroding of our social safety net is okay because it's saving this thing called the economy, as opposed to potentially putting the economy to work in a way that further empowers our everyday ordinary experiences. 
So it's these everyday experiences, it's these areas of life which in a way are to do with art and our senses that preoccupy Rancière. Not because we want more beauty or art like paintings and poetry in our lives, though all of that would be of course very nice, but you know, no one's asking you to suddenly go out and appreciate Beethoven or Mozart or anything here. This is this is really about, I suppose, taking the idea of art or the idea of, of an aesthetic realm as a potential model or diagram or blueprint around which we can organize our perceptions and our imagination. Are we able to have a collective conversation? Are we able to have a collective imagination that we contribute to democratically as a people, which permits us to set up our compartmentalize limits to the way the economy can affect our sensual lives, our sensual experiences, right? You know, think about it this way. I, I, this is not in the book, but it's, it's maybe how I'm reading Davies's comments here. If you go to a museum and you look at all the different pieces of art, there's a huge range of different types of art available for you to look at. One question would be mentally, how do you take all that in? How do you find yourself within yourself a sensitivity to all these different modalities of art? What sort of person does the museum ask you to become such that you can appreciate all of this? You know, m maybe it's possible that the version of you in the museum who's appreciating art is actually a very democratic person because all these sensual expressions, all these aesthetic expressions, they're, they're coming to you with very different sets of claims behind them about what counts as art. And maybe you realize art counts as potentially almost anything that someone cares to mention, right? So in this sense, an aesthetic person, an aesthetically sensitive person, this is how I'm reading this, is the kind of person that you want politically in a democracy, okay? So when Rancière, and Davies is paraphrasing here, says that democracy is the precondition for politics, it's because it is the only way that everyone can be sensitive to all the claims and passions and needs of the world. In that kind of world, the economy and the political are not separated. In that kind of world, they're fundamentally implicated in each other. So the, the realm of the aesthetic then, and that's why we're discussing Rancière, and, and it's a complex part of the chapter, I'll grant you, but I think the bottom line here is that what we got to take away is the realm of the aesthetic as a type of source for a way to imagine democracy and democratic life together. So I'll be right back after the break and we'll have part two of the lecture. Talk to you then.